Hello, I'm Dr. Douglas Casa. I work at the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut. Today, we're going to discuss heat and hydration issues and strategies for football players. To begin, let's look at how the body deals with heat. When we exercise, the working muscles produce heat. This is a normal and natural part of exercise. The environment also can add heat through high air temperatures, relative humidity, and radiant energy from the sun. To prevent the negative effects of having too much heat stirred up, the human body sweats. As sweat evaporates from the skin, heat is transferred away from the body. Sweat rates can be affected by factors that coaches must recognize. Intensity of exercise and the environmental conditions are the two most important factors that influence sweat rate. But certain environmental conditions, such as high humidity, can hinder sweat evaporation. Considering these issues, a comprehensive approach to addressing heat illness is needed. So let's begin. The first risk factor we will discuss today is heat acclimatization. Heat acclimatization is a series of adaptations that happen inside the body, which prepares it for exercise in the heat. Heat acclimatization helps the body maintain a lower temperature and heart rate during exercise, enhances sweating rates, and allows the body to store more water. The changes that take place with heat acclimatization allow the body to stay cooler during physical activity. This allows the athlete to stay safer during the practice session. To acclimatize athletes, coaches should plan on a 10 to 14 day period in which they progressively intensify exercise, increase practice length, and add to the amount of equipment worn by players. On days one and two, single practice and helmets only with no contact. On days three through five, a single practice in helmets and shoulder pads, contact is allowed only with dummies and sleds. On days six through 14, double sessions are allowed, but the total practice time for the day should not exceed five hours, and there should be at least three hours between each of the practice sessions. Practices in this stage can be fully padded and full contact. Additionally, on days six through 14, two-a-day practices should not happen on successive days. It is important to remember that warm-ups, stretching, water breaks, and conditioning all count towards the total practice time. Also, for each of the 14 days, a one-hour walkthrough is allowable. This session must be separated from practice by at least three hours and is limited to one hour in length. For youth football leagues that practice fewer than five times a week, keep in mind that only practice days when athletes are on the field and exposed to conditions count toward acclimatization. As described earlier, environmental conditions can make it harder for athletes to get rid of heat so coaches need to be aware and ready to modify practice for athlete safety. When monitoring the environmental conditions, you may be familiar with the term heat index, but a better way of doing that is called the wet bulb globe temperature, also known as the WBGT. It's a better way of assessing environmental conditions because it accounts for air temperature, humidity, and the heat from the sun. When wet bulb globe temperature is moderate or high, exercise should be modified to reduce the risk of heat illness. Some of the modifications that can be implemented include longer hydration breaks, having hydration breaks more often, removing or wearing less equipment during practice, decreasing the intensity of practice, or shortening practice. These important modifications based on environmental factors are effective ways to reduce risk during practice and must be continually monitored and implemented. Most often coaches think of hydration in relation to performance, but staying hydrated also keeps your body temperature lower and maximizes player safety. Water is recommended as the primary fluid during all types of exercise. Water is the least expensive, most accessible, and most important fluid during exercise. Sports drinks contain water, electrolytes, and sugar, which are important components of a rehydration beverage, especially when exercise is going to last longer than 60 minutes or if they're going to be doing intense exercise in the heat. Remember, we are dealing with kids and some prefer the taste of sports drinks. This may lead to more fluid being consumed during activities and an enhanced hydration status. Regardless if your athlete drinks sports drinks or water, it's really important that you check their hydration status and you monitor fluid consumption. The best way to monitor dehydration is with body weight changes. Utilizing body weight changes pre-practice to post-practice tells us how much an athlete has lost during activity, and most of the weight lost during activity is due to hydration losses. If the assessment of body weight changes is not feasible at your practice site, another useful tool is utilizing urine color either before or after practice. Urine that is light in color, like lemonade, would indicate the athlete is hydrated. Urine color that is dark, like apple juice, would indicate they're likely dehydrated. Athletes that have lost weight during practice or have dark urine need to be encouraged to continue consuming fluids at home to assure they get back to a well-hydrated condition. If using the weight change method, in which you would look at body weight changes from pre-practice to post-practice, athletes should consume 16 ounces of fluid for every pound of body weight lost. That's about one bottle per pound. While there are no specific guidelines if using a urine color chart, 
encourage athletes to drink and recheck their urine until they reach a lemonade color. Coaches and parents should encourage athletes to aim to replace those fluids in the two hours immediately after a practice session. Remember coaches, you can help combat these problems during practice by always making sure fluids are available and never restricting athletes from getting a drink. You also should be sure to schedule water breaks every 15 to 20 minutes and more so if the exercise is very intense or if it's really hot outside. For more information on hydration assessment and strategies to prevent dehydration, visit the Corey Stringer Institute website at www.ksi.uconn.edu. Even with the best of planning, heat illnesses can occur, especially when other risk factors are present. In the next section, we will look at the signs, symptoms, and treatment of the four major heat illnesses most common in sport. Heat syncope refers to a fainting or lightheaded episode during exercise. It is normally seen in unfit or unacclimatized athletes and is caused by blood pooling in the legs. Treatment for heat syncope is to put the athletes in a laying down position with their legs propped approximately one to two feet off the ground. In addition to propping the feet, allow the athlete to rehydrate at a level that's comfortable for them. The combination of rehydration and propping the feet will encourage blood flow to return to the heart and recovery is usually rapid. Heat cramps are most common during intense exercise in the heat when there's dehydration, electrolyte losses, and fatigue. Athletes with higher sweat rates may be more susceptible to heat cramps and may need to be encouraged to keep up with their electrolyte consumption. Heat cramps are usually localized but can wander throughout the muscle. To treat an athlete with heat cramps, implement these three things. One, rehydrate them. Two, allow them to rest. And three, consider some gentle stretching. Heat cramps are not life-threatening but a more severe condition called exertional sickling can look a lot like heat cramps. Athletes with exertional sickling are not getting enough oxygen because of sickle cell trait. In these cases, an athlete may report cramping, but you will not be able to feel the cramping in the muscle. Call 911 immediately if you suspect exertional sickling because it could be a life-threatening condition, and especially if you know the athlete has sickle cell trait. Heat exhaustion is a term for a medical condition for an athlete who cannot continue exercise in the heat. Heat exhaustion is caused by either a fluid or sodium loss. With less water in the body, it has less fluid for the heart to use to maintain activity level. To treat heat exhaustion, remove the athlete from activity and place him or her in a shaded or cool area while providing rehydration. As with heat syncope, the athlete should be laid flat with their feet propped and cooling methods such as cold towels, misting fans, or water immersion may be utilized. Heat exhaustion is a non-life-threatening condition but needs to be acknowledged and treated correctly. The most severe form of heat illness is exertional heat stroke, or EHS. EHS is a medical emergency that requires immediate attention to prevent long-term issues or even death. EHS is defined by two characteristics. One, a core body temperature at the time of collapse of 104 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And second, central nervous system dysfunction. Central nervous system dysfunction can be anything as loss of consciousness, someone in a coma, convulsions, altered behavior, aggressive behavior, or anything that seems out of sorts for that individual. All of the risk factors we discuss can predispose an athlete to EHS and should be monitored by the coaching staff. When EHS is suspected, call 911 immediately, and after you call 911, begin immediate whole body aggressive cooling on site. If EHS is suspected and an immersion tub is not available, consider one of the following three options. First, cold water from a shower. Second, dousing the athlete from cold water from a hose, or third, rotating ice wet towels over the entire body. The most effective way to cool an athlete is with whole body cold water immersion. So the procedure should go as follows. First, remove as much clothing and equipment as possible. Second, assess the rectal temperature of the athlete. If heat stroke is suspected, you want to immerse the athlete up to chest level in a tub of ice and water. There are three important considerations to implement when utilizing cold water immersion. One, be sure to store the water during the entire cooling process. This enhances the cooling rates. Second, be sure to secure the athlete with a towel or long sheet underneath the armpits to make sure the athlete does not slip into the water. And three, take them out of the water when their body temperature reaches 102 degrees Fahrenheit. To use this treatment effectively, proactive steps need to be taken by your team or league to ensure a tub is available at all practice sites. Because exertional heat stroke is a life-threatening situation, the proper equipment and emergency action plan are critical to getting the athlete's core temperature under 104 degrees in the most important 30-minute window. The key to surviving exertional heat stroke is rapid reduction of core body temperature, 
preferably cooling on site. We encourage all organizations to develop a policy for administering this treatment. With proper information and quality planning, coaches can acclimatize their athletes, monitor external risk factors, and encourage proper hydration on the field and at home. All coaches should be able to recognize the signs of heat illness and know the proper care. Please use the material presented here today, refer to this course throughout the season, and visit the Corey Stringer Institute if more information is needed. Together, we can strive for a better, safer football experience for our children. For the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut, I'm Dr. Douglas Casa. Thank you.